This is all that remains of the Italian hall. In 1913, 73 people died here when someone yelled fire in the crowded hall during a party being held for the children of striking copper miners. There was no fire. To understand how this could happen, someone yelling fire in a crowded children's Christmas party, it is important to understand the context. Particularly, we must look at what led up to that point. In 1913, the Italian Hall was a well-known meeting place for miners and union members. The lower floor housed two businesses, a saloon on the left and an Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company store on the right. The entrance to the upstairs hall was on the far left. Behind the arch and the doors was a steep flight of stairs. Calumet was actually the name of the region in northern Michigan. The town where the Italian Hall stood was known as Red Jacket. At the time, the area was much more populated than it is today. This aerial view shows how Calumet sits in the middle of the Keweenaw Peninsula in the heart of Michigan's copper country. In 1913, the area enjoyed almost universal employment. Any able-bodied man willing to work could get a job in the mines. There were no skills required and no language requirements. As a result, the area became a magnet for immigrants. However, the work in the mines was difficult and dangerous. During this time, it was not uncommon for one man to die in the mines per week. And for every man who died, there were 10 more who suffered serious injuries. This was during a time before workmen's compensation laws and injured workers and their families could not count on recovering much, if anything, from the mines after an accident. The lowest paid workers in the mines were the trammers who pushed heavy tram cars filled with rock. They often worked for the equivalent of two or three dollars a day, but they were not paid by the hour. They were paid by how much rock they moved. And none of the mines in the area used scales to weigh the rock. It was left to each trammer boss to simply estimate how much he believed each tram load weighed. The nature of the work and the method of pay naturally led to disenchantment among many of the workers. The Western Federation of Miners sent recruiters into the area and began organizing the workers. They gained traction in 1913 with one of the rallying cries centered on a new piece of equipment, the one-man drill. Charles Moyer was the head of the Western Federation of Miners and was well known and feared by mine management. He had organized miners out west and the strikes there had gotten quite messy. Moyer, along with two other union men, had been charged with murder but after the first two men were acquitted, the case against Moyer was simply dismissed. Even so, mine management often pointed to the Union as violent criminals. In July 1913, the Union had enough members to successfully call a strike. They held a vote and asked their membership if the Union should present itself to management and attempt to negotiate collectively. They also asked the membership if it authorized a strike if management refused the Union recognition. The results were overwhelming. A strike was authorized if management would not bargain collectively with the Western Federation of Miners. The Western Federation of Miners sent letters to all of the mines and waited. Management ignored the letters. The Western Federation of Miners called a strike and the workers walked out. The entire mining industry in the q and was shut down. Management dug in and prepared for a long fight. The workers were happy they had caused the shutdown, but were unclear as to what would happen next. And how long would the strike last? Mine management did not want to wait and see what would happen. The mines sought permission to have its loyal workers, many of whom were English-speaking managers, deputized by the sheriff. Soon, hundreds of non-union members were in the streets carrying badges and guns with little or no supervision. Further, Mine management asked the County Board of Supervisors to hire strike breakers to be paid with government money. The board, which was loaded with mining interests, agreed. Soon, hundreds of strike breakers from New York were on the streets of the Copper Country with little instruction other than to make life difficult for the strikers. The hiring of the strike breakers by the local government body was so unusual that the strike breaking company bragged about it in its correspondence with others. Before this, strike breakers had normally been hired by the industries trying to put down a strike. Here, the local government had taken sides. 
Many of the strike breakers were also deputized illegally, giving them even more protection for their actions. Mine managers also pressured the local government officials to ask Lansing to send the National Guard. The governor, reading panicked telegrams which described riots in the streets of Calumet, sent the guard. When the National Guard arrived, they found no rioting. The Western Federation of Miners took to the streets, parading in large shows of force and solidarity. Leading many of the parades was Annie Clements. Of Slovenian descent, she was married to a striking miner and had been active in the Slovenian community before the strike. Now she took up the cause of the workers. In this famous photograph, Annie stands next to an Italian Union organizer named Ben Goggin as a National Guardsman on horseback watches. During the strike, Annie was arrested several times and once famously refused to leave a public roadway when a group of guardsmen ordered her to leave. When a guardsman knocked her American flag from her hands, it fell to the ground. Later, when hearings were held over the incident, more attention was paid to the American flag on the ground than to Annie's cut hand. After a month, it became clear that the guardsmen were not needed, and the governor recalled half of them. The next day, two striking Croatian men walked from the town of Sieberville to South Range, hoping to get strike benefits. On their way home, they stopped at the general store on the edge of Painsdale, and then walked a path they always took, which crossed company property. They encountered an English-speaking manager named Humphrey Quick. Quick had been told to guard that path. He spoke no Croatian and told the men in English they had to turn around. The men, who spoke very little English, did not understand what Quick was trying to tell them, so they ignored him and continued on their way. The man went and told his boss about the event. The man's boss had grown up in a bilingual family, and apparently realized that what caused the problem had been a language difficulty. He told Quick to go get the men and bring them to him so he could talk to them. Quick went and along the way picked up some strike breakers and two other workers who were not on strike but had been deputized. All of the men in the group except for Quick were carrying guns. The group of gunmen went to the Putrich boarding house in Sieberville where the two men lived. The gunmen spotted one of the strikers in the yard. The gunmen, with their guns drawn, jumped the fence and attempted to kidnap one of the men. The yard had been filled with other men who had been playing a lawn bowling game, and they quickly came to the rescue of their fellow countrymen. A skirmish broke out in the yard as the men tried to escape into the house. The gunmen chased the men, and one of them, named Cooper, fired his gun at random and hit a bystander, hitting the landlord's brother in the abdomen. After the first shot had been fired by the gunmen, they all gathered around the house and began firing into it until they were all out of ammunition. They then calmly walked away. Two men died from the gunfire. Neither of them had anything to do with the incident earlier that day on the trail. Two other men were hit by gunfire and a baby in the house received powder burns to its face. The gunmen were convinced they would not get in trouble for what they had done and they almost did get away with it. The sheriff arrested some of the victims and even helped the gunmen hide. The Putrich boarding house was run by Croatians, and its tenants were also Croatian. A Croatian named Anthony Lucas was the county prosecutor, and he insisted on charging the men with murder. Eventually, the gunmen were brought back to the area and arrested. Even so, the incident at Sieberville convinced many in the Union that mine management would stop at nothing in its fight with the Union. The strike dragged on. In December, a house in Painsdale was shot up one night. Five men, using high-powered rifles, fired dozens and dozens of shots into the Daly Jane boarding house, which was known for housing workers who were willing to cross the picket line. The house sat across the street from a boarding house filled with strike breakers. After the shooting, authorities found gun shells from five different calibers of rifles and footprints in the snow of as many men. Later, management would agitate to prosecute a single man for the shooting, a union organizer named John Huda. Several strike breakers and deputies were called before various tribunals to give evidence in the case, but all pled the fifth. The Daly Jane shootings were played up in the local English language media as being the result of strikers wantonly killing allies of mine management. The papers were making these pronouncements long before anyone had been arrested for the shootings, 
even as all the evidence pointed to the shootings as being committed by strike breakers. Mine management turned to an old playbook and organized a citizens alliance. The alliance was a front group funded by the mines and given tacit approval to take action against the union, legal or illegal. Using the Daly Jane murders as a rallying cry, the alliance held massive meetings where speakers exhorted the audience to go out and take action against the union. Soon union halls were being ransacked and union members were being openly assaulted. The Citizens Alliance was formed in December 1913. The strike dragged on. It was clear that management would never agree to collectively bargain with the union. As the union leadership considered its next moves, some members of the union, led by Big Annie, decided to throw a Christmas party for the children of the strikers. They would hold a modest affair at the Italian Hall. Word spread in the community, and in the early afternoon, hundreds of children, along with parents, climbed the steep stairs to the upper floor of the Italian Hall, Christmas Eve, 1913. The hall became crowded. They sang hymns in different languages, and children were invited up on stage to meet Santa Claus and receive modest gifts. Around 4.40 in the afternoon, a man came into the building from the outside, climbed the stairs, stepped through the doors into the main hall, and shouted, Fire! twice in the English language. Most in the hall panicked and repeated the cry. The man who shouted fire turned around and fled. Children and adults swarmed towards the stairs as confusion and chaos filled the room. The first few down the stairs made it outside the building, but someone tripped and fell, and those rushing from behind continued pushing toward the stairs. Soon, people piled up in the stairwell. Perhaps a hundred people were caught in the stairs, the weight of those behind and on top pressing down on them. Of those, 73 would die. Someone on the street called in a fire alarm, and the Red Jacket Fire Department was only a block away. Soon, firefighters arrived on the scene, but there was no fire. Seeing the people jammed into the stairway, they went around the building and up a fire escape on the side. They managed to calm the confusion in the hall and began the task of clearing the stairwell. Eventually, they would carry the victims to the village hall, which had been set up as a temporary morgue. The Red Jacket Fire Department logbook entry is the first official record of the disaster. It notes that the run was made at 4.45 in the afternoon and says fire alarm. December 24th, 1913, Box 45, Italian Hall, Disaster, No Fire, Christmas Festival for the Children of the Western Federation of Miners, Fire Call and a Stampede Following Down Stairway, all piling on top of one another at foot of stairs. 73 lives were crushed out, mostly children, about 10 grown persons. A local photographer named William Nara heard of the disaster and took his camera around and photographed the hall, the victims, and later the funerals. His images would become widely circulated. The news also spread across the nation and even headlined stories internationally. Readers in cities across America saw the news on Christmas morning, usually on the front page. But an interesting phenomenon took place. While the stories were fairly balanced outside of the Copper Country, the stories quickly became slanted in the local newspapers. The Daily Mining Gazette ran a headline about the disaster, but also claimed that Charles Moyer and the Western Federation of Miners was somehow profiting from the catastrophe. Of course, there were voices on both sides of the debate. With more than half the victims being of Finnish descent, it was only natural that a local pro-union Finnish newspaper would weigh in on the debate. 83 murdered was the headline with a subhead which clearly accused Citizens Alliance hooligans of causing the disaster. Interestingly, the Finnish paper's version of the story was closer to the truth than the stories in the Daily Mining Gazette. Charles Moyer, the head of the Western Federation of Miners, had been in a hotel room in Hancock when someone phoned him with the news. He began sending telegrams to people in positions of authority, pleading with them to conduct an investigation into that evening's events. Word reached mine management that Moyer was demanding an investigation, and soon the sheriff showed up at Moyer's hotel room and demanded that he immediately issue a statement exonerating mine management 
and all its allies of wrongdoing. Moyer refused, and the sheriff ominously told him he could not be protected from that point forward. After the sheriff left, a group of men, openly wearing Citizens Alliance pins, entered Moyer's room, beat him, shot him, and kidnapped him. They hauled him into the street and across the bridge to Houghton. They dragged him onto a train to Chicago and threatened to kill him if he ever returned. The men who beat and shot Moyer would be identified later, but never prosecuted for the assault and the kidnapping. The Italian hall disaster left the community with 73 dead. The funerals were a daunting task. Services were held in several churches, and most of the dead were buried on December 28th. Reporters flocked to Calumet to cover the event. The churches coordinated so that those in attendance could join a single procession, which made its way to the Lakeview Cemetery outside of town. There, many of the victims would be buried in mass graves, the Protestant victims on one side of the cemetery and the Catholics on the other. Many of the graves would not be marked. The sheer magnitude of the disaster is hard to fathom. 73 dead, 60 were children. More than half were of Finnish descent. At least three families lost three children. One family had four children at the party, and only one came home. A mother and daughter died. A mother and father perished while their baby survived. Each of the 73 is undoubtedly a tragedy. Combined, the magnitude is unthinkable. Who would be held accountable? Witnesses said they could identify the man who cried fire. Many witnesses said he wore a Citizens Alliance pin. The job fell to the local coroner, who held hearings over three days. It became clear very quickly what his intentions were. Witnesses whose primary language was not English were not provided interpreters. They were asked questions in English and forced to answer in English. Some witnesses were called who had not even been there that day. Follow-up questions were not asked. The focus of the inquest soon turned toward blaming the victims and the union. Even though no evidence supported it, the coroner ruled that the cry of fire had probably been raised by a union member and that the security at the hall had been so tight that no one could possibly have gotten in to raise the cry of fire otherwise. His position was not supported by the evidence, but it became the official ruling. A grand jury had been seated in Houghton County earlier that year and given the task of investigating strike crimes. Some in the community thought that perhaps they would investigate the Italian Hall. The grand jury issued no indictments for the Italian Hall nor any for the beating and kidnapping of Charles Moyer. Instead, they issued an indictment against Moyer for his union organizing activities. The grand jury was loaded with mine management allies. Nine of them admitted to being Citizens Alliance members. Later, the governor was so shocked by the topsy-turvy justice of the grand jury that he demanded to know its members and their occupations. Several were mine employees. Some were contractors for mines. One was the chauffeur for the president of the largest mine in the area. There would be no justice for the victims of the Italian Hall. The strike was called off in April 1914. Some workers had left the area already and others found different jobs. Some returned to work where they were forced to tear up their union cards. The mines grudgingly gave the workers a slight raise and shortened the working day. It would be many years before the workers would try unionizing again. The Italian Hall was used for many other purposes in the following decades and eventually began to show its age. In the 1980s, it was largely unused. The village of Calumet considered rehabilitating it, but the cost is prohibitive. Some members of the community wanted it saved, while others simply considered it a reminder of the worst event in the region's history. The building was demolished in 1984. All that remains is the arch, which has been moved to the center of the lot and a historical marker to tell the story.